Blessed Elizabeth Canori Mora was a mystic of the church who died in 1825. Her visions would be published long after her death and gained an imprimatur in 1941, which means that the faithful are permitted to read and reflect upon her message. What you will hear is often by various commentators interpreted as visions of our times, a description of the state of the church and those who infiltrated it, <laughs> the fate they will come to, the three days of darkness, the convulsions of nature against man as a sign of God's wrath, and other sorts of rather pleasant sounding events that are characteristic of these kinds of warnings. Her beatification cause opened in 1874 under Pope Pius IX, and in 1928 named Venerable under Pope Pius XI, and was beatified by John Paul II. Recall that John Paul II declared Marie Julie Jehenny Venerable, which seems to indicate that he saw continuity between Blessed Elizabeth Canori Mora and Marie Julie Jehenny. Make of that what you will, especially in light of the Third Secret of Fatima, which John Paul II did speak about in a sort of off-handed and subtle way numerous times. To give you an idea of how she is portrayed by the church today, here's a bio presented from a more, shall we say, mainline Catholic resource. It is factual, but it seems to omit most of the warnings. In an age plagued by dysfunctional families, it is refreshing to read of a troubled couple who finally became a source of sanctity to each other. In April 1994, Pope John Paul II beatified a matron who qualifies as an exemplary wife and mother. Elizabeth Canori was herself the child of an admirable Catholic couple. Born in Rome on November 21, 1774, she was sent to a convent school in Kaskia. During her three years there, the Augustinian sisters were impressed by her high intelligence, spirituality, and self-denial. On her return to Rome, she only increased in wisdom and good deeds. In 1796, she married Cristoforo Mora, a fledgling lawyer. Elizabeth had chosen her mate with deliberation, but after only a few months, he showed signs of personal instability. Swept off his feet by a woman of lower estate, he deceived his wife and alienated himself from his family, even failing to provide for it. Though battered and disdained, Senora Mora struck, stuck by the rules of Christian fidelity and self-giving. She, she almost died in 1801, but was mysteriously cured, and in this connection experienced her first mystical experience. Of their four children, the two girls survived. She supported them by manual labor, not neglecting, meanwhile, the regular domestic chores. Prayer and care of the sick and poor took up the rest of her every days. There are some persons to whom the, those in need naturally turn for assistance and strength. Elizabeth was such a person, and many sought her out for material and spiritual aid. She was especially attentive to other troubled families. The human family, she firmly believed, was the unit of society where peace could be best achieved through the practice of faith, responsibility, and mutual affection. She struggled to maintain that atmosphere in her own home and to communicate it to other households. For her, the model family was that of Nazareth, in which Jesus himself, as the central figure, set the tone for all the rest. In fact, she offered her whole life for the peace of the household of the faith, which is the church, for the conversion of her husband who had betrayed his own family, and for the salvation of all sinners. The Trinitarian friars have a third order. Signora Mora joined the secular fraternity in 1807. Under the guidance of the friars, she developed still more profoundly in her vocation to family life. Now her reputation for goodness and holiness became even more widely respected, not only in Rome, but in its suburban cities. Mariana and Luciana Mora showed themselves her true daughters when they took care of their mother during her last illness. She died on February 5, 1825, and was buried in the Trinitarian Friars Church in Rome. Before her death, she had predicted that Cristoforo, the husband of her grief, would eventually come to his senses. Her constant prayer for his conversion was answered shortly after she died. The straying lawyer made his peace with God and himself joined the Trinitarian Third Order. Later on, he entered the conventual Franciscans and was ordained a priest, dying in 1845. Fidelity in marriage is not an easy virtue, but it is a creative one. Cristoforo Mora learned that only gradually. His wife, early, early aware of the need to imitate Christ's own commitment, was truly faithful unto death. Those are the words of Father Robert F. McNamara for the St. Kateri Center. Now I present the approved message of Blessed Elizabeth Canori Mora. On the Feast of St. Peter, 29th of June, 1820, whilst I was praying for the wants of the Church and the conversion of sinners, amongst whom I am the first, I was ravished in spirit and drawn very near to God. 
Through an infinite light I was so intimately united to him that I lost all sentiments of myself. The sweet impressions of the love of God replenished me with an inexpressible joy and satisfaction. My soul, however, remained calm in these tokens of divine kindness. Then it seemed to me to behold the heavens opening, and St. Peter, Prince of the Apostles, coming down, surrounded with great glory, and by a numerous escort of heavenly spirits, singing canticles. St. Peter was dressed in his pontifical robes, and held in his right hand the pastoral staff, with which he used to draw upon the earth an immense cross. At the same time the angels sang these words of the psalmist, Constutes et principis, super omnem terum. You will constitute them princes over the whole earth. After this, the holy apostle touched with his staff the four extremities of the cross, from which sprung up four beautiful trees loaded with blossoms and fruits. These mysterious trees had the form of a cross and were surrounded by a splendid light. Then I comprehended in the depth of my soul that St. Peter had produced these four symbolic trees to the end that they might serve as a place of refuge to the little flocks of the faithful friends of Jesus Christ, and in order to preserve them from the fearful punishment which shall convulse the whole earth. All good Christians shall be protected under these trees, together with all those religious persons who shall have faithfully preserved in their hearts the spirit of their order. I say the same thing in relation to the secular clergy and to all other persons of every class who, have sh who shall have kept in their heart the Catholic faith. They shall be protected, but woe to those religious who do not observe their rule. Thrice unhappy they, for they shall all be struck by that terrible punishment. I say the same to all secular clergy, and to all classes of people in the world who give themselves to a life of pleasure, and who follow the false maxims of modern ideas, which are opposed to the holy precepts of the gospel. These wretched people, who through their scandalous conduct deny the faith of Jesus Christ, shall punish under the weight of the indignant arm of God's justice. Not one of them shall be able to escape the punishment. What comes next is described in her writings in the following way. Blessed Elizabeth then saw apostates brazenly trying to rip her most holy son from her arms. Her, meaning the mother of God. Confronting with such an outrage, the mother of God ceased to ask mercy for the world, and instead requested justice from the Eternal Father. Clothed in his inexorable justice and full of indignation, he turned to the world. I beheld those good Christians who had sought a refuge under those mysterious trees, in the form of beautiful lambs confided to the care and vigilance of St. Peter, their good shepherd, testifying to him the most humble and most respectful obedience. As soon as St. Peter, the Prince of the Apostles, had gathered the flock of Jesus in a place of safety, he reascended into heaven, accompanied by legions of angels. Scarcely had they disappeared when the sky was covered with clouds so dense and dismal that it was impossible to look at them without dismay. On a sudden there burst out a, such a terrible and violent wind that its noise seemed like the roars of furious lions. The sound of the dreadful hurricane was heard over the whole earth. Fear and terror struck not only men, but the very beasts. All men shall rise one against the other, and they shall kill one another without pity. During this sanguinary conflict, the avenging arm of God will strike the wicked, and in his mighty power he will punish their pride and presumption. God will employ the powers of hell for the extermination of these impious and heretical persons who desire to overthrow the church and destroy it to its very foundation. These presumptuous men in their mad impiety believe they can overthrow God from his throne, but the Lord will despise their artifices, and through an effect of his almighty hand he will punish these impious blasphemers by giving permission to the infernal spirits to come out from hell. Innumerable legions of demons shall overrun the earth, and shall execute the orders of divine justice, by causing terrible calamities and disasters. They shall attack everything. They shall injure individual persons and entire families. They shall devastate property and alimentary productions, cities and villages. Nothing on earth shall be spared. God will allow the demons to strike with death those impious men because they gave themselves up to the infernal powers and had formed with, with them a compact against the Catholic Church. Being desirous of more fully penetrating my spirit with a deeper sentiment of his divine justice, God showed to me the awful abyss. I saw in the bowels of the earth a dark and frightful cavern where an infinite number of demons were issuing forth, who under the form of men and beasts came to ravage the world, leaving everywhere ruins and blood. Happy will be all true and good Catholics 
they shall experience the powerful protection of the holy apostles, Saints Peter and Saint Paul, who will watch over them lest they may be injured either in their persons or their property. Those evil spirits shall plunder every place where God has been outraged, despised, and blasphemed. The edifices they profane will be pulled down and destroyed, and nothing but ruins shall remain of them. After this frightful punishment, I saw the heavens opening and St. Peter coming down again upon earth. He was vested in his pontifical robes and surrounded by a great number of angels, who were chanting hymns in his honor, and they proclaimed him as sovereign of the earth. I also saw St. Paul descending upon the earth. By God's command, he traversed the earth and unchained the demons, who he brought before St. Peter, who commanded them to return into hell whence they had come. Then a great light appeared upon the earth, which was the sign of the reconciliation of God with man. The angels conducted before the throne of the prince of the apostles the small flock that had remained faithful to Jesus Christ. These good and zealous Christians testified to him the most powerful, profound respect, praising God and thanking the apostles for having delivered them from the common destruction and for having protected the church of Jesus Christ by not permitting her to be infected with the false maxim of the world. St. Peter then chose the new pope. The church was again organized. Religious orders were re-established. Re the private families of ordinary Christians, through their great fervor and zeal for the glory of God, became like the most exemplary religious communities. Such is the glorious triumph reserved for the Catholic Church. She shall be praised, honored, and esteemed by all men. All men shall become Catholics and shall acknowledge the Pope as Vicar of Jesus Christ. Amen. In closing... This sounds to me like a warning for our times, which is why I present it to you. The faithful among the laity are those who strive to remain loyal to the teachings of the Church in spite of the modernism coming from Rome. I'm reminded of what Archbishop Lefebvre spoke about when saying he was a loyal son of eternal Rome, that eternal, timeless, unchanging Catholic faith, not as facsimile being thrust upon the world. If anything, the words of Blessed Elizabeth Canori Mora are a warning and a plea to keep the real, true faith and not to give an inch to the modernists, for to do so will lead to your destruction. At least that's how I interpret this message. Let me know your thoughts in the comments. Thank you for listening. I'm Anthony Stein. Ave Maria.